Hey, thanks so much for taking the time to watch our film, Making a Killing, Unmasking the Truth Behind Deadly Hospital Protocols. I'm Derek, the owner of Inspired Films and the director of this film. This is Patty. She is a producer and her story about her husband, Tony, is the foundational story that drives this whole documentary. This is Dana. She's also in the film, taking a stand for her mom. But we just want to say how grateful we are that you are watching this and helping us spread awareness. The purpose of this film is not to only tell Tony's story, but we want to also spread awareness about what's really going on in the hospitals and just in healthcare overall. We want to be a voice to the voiceless and fight for those hundreds of thousands of people with similar stories who are not able to speak up on their own. We come from all walks of life and we all have different opinions, but we ask you to approach this film with an open mind. The fact is that a lot of people don't really know what's going on in the medical field. There's corruption, there are incentives, and there are agendas. The focus of healthcare has shifted from patient care to financial incentives. I hope that as you listen to our stories, you will be challenged and moved to join us in this fight because it's not just our fight. There are so many who have been affected by horrible protocols and by the government getting in the way and making decisions about our health care. Patients should have a say in which doctors they want to work with, and they should be able to decide what type of treatment they want to use. There are many doctors who have taken a stand against all of this corruption and actually care about their patients, and that's the goal to put care back in health care. Yeah, and there's, there's so much going on in our world right now, and this is a discussion that needs to be at the forefront of the conversation. Patty and Dana are just two stories among thousands, and they've made the brave move to take a stand. So if you have a similar story, we encourage you to be bold and take a stand as well. This film is really a kickoff to a docu-series that we will be making. We are currently raising funds and gaining support to spread more awareness through these types of films. So if you would like to partner with us financially, or maybe you have a story that you would like to share, please visit our website for more information. We thank you for your support as we fight for truth. Myers and I'm a assistant behavior analyst and I have two nonprofits that I'm in charge of. My husband's name was Joe Anthony Myers. He goes by Tony and he for years was a physical therapist assistant but later, closer to when he was sick, he was helping me with uh, our nonprofits and my mom who had some strokes. So, uh, in my nonprofits, uh, Building Pathways, he helped, the, he was the bus driver, the maintenance guy, the game player, the joker, um, a lot of support listening to me. So, we met at King College in Bristol, Tennessee. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. He grew up in Marion, Virginia. So I was the city girl and he was the country boy. He was always funny, um, very personable, talked with everybody. His, his whole demeanor and personality just drew people in. He just was fun. He, we just had fun together. I remember literally where I was standing when I thought he's the one. I remember where I was in my room. It was a summer time, so we were apart, you know. And I remember thinking, oh dear, I think he's the one. So I was 19 and he was 21 when we first met. So, um, and we dated three years, I guess it would be, till we got married. Um, and he came to Fort Lauderdale where I grew up and asked my dad if he could marry me and we went to the beach and I thought it's a funny story. And so I didn't know he was doing that. I thought he would ask me at some point, but I didn't know it was then. 
and he said let's look for shells that was our first shell looking experience and i'm like i don't want to look for shells i just want to hold your hand and cuddle and walk on the beach and the next thing i know i somehow hit his arm in a way that the ring fell in the sand <laughs> And he said, oh no, the ring fell. And I said, what ring? <laughs> and, um, and then he asked me, we both cried and it was awesome. So Tony was always laughing. Tony was always connecting with people. He always wanted to uh, make the mood light. He was a kind person. He thought of others before himself. He was loving. He made me feel secure. He was a hard worker. We were married 31, I call it plus years. And together about 34 years. Our dream for the future was to get a hut. <laughs> because that's all we could afford probably on St. Abel Island. We love the beaches, so any anything beachy, but that really was our dream to figure out uh, how to get over there at some point and just kind of live on the beach. Dana Stevens. Um, I'm a stay-at-home mom, but I have a background in nursing um, and a pretty extensive background in the medical field. Uh, originally from Florida, um, Fort Lauderdale area. When I think back about my mom, her name was Rebecca Stevens. Um, she, uh, most of her work life, she was a uh, bookkeeping um, her family owned like a construction business like asphalt company uh, while she was growing up she was a germaphobe so cleaning the smell of pine saw <laughs> um, she loved to cook um, she would do you know when you grow up with not a lot of money you, you know good parents will kind of do things without money like I remember driving around uh, around Christmas just look at lights and um, just little things like that she was the most loyal, um, loyal person. She wasn't very uh, social as far as like having, being a social butterfly and having lots of friends, but the few she did, she kept close, but um, she was just loyal to the end and nobody messed with her kids or her grandkids. Um, she was extremely courageous and brave and was never afraid to speak up for what was right and that's kind of where I hope I get that from. <laughs> you know, she she always put us first and, uh, you know, as far as, uh, she was never afraid to um, stand up for what she thought was right and um, she never let anybody take advantage of us. Um, and <clears throat> she just stuck up for herself and her family and never bowed down and she was very, brave and strong so. so I have the two programs I have the building pathways and pathways for life Academy and uh, people started getting sick um, and one person got sick and the next day we took everybody including Tony uh, because he was with the sick person the day before taking her to the doctor. So we took everybody, uh, got them tested, and he was negative, and I was positive. So we quarantined all the people. I quarantined myself. I was by myself. Um, and two days later, um, I had symptoms like in the middle of the night. I maybe had symptoms for 24 hours, that was it. Um, and then the next day, he said he wasn't feeling well. And he went back and got tested, and he was tested positive for COVID. So he started with fever, uh, aches, uh, really deep body aches, he said. 
uh, and a cough. He coughed the whole night, and then that's the next day he went to get tested again. He, uh, you know, he would measure, he was a therapist, so he was measuring his oxygen and such, and it was dipping in the 80s sometimes. So I said, let's call the doctor again. This was Sunday. So he had been diagnosed over a week. And um, the doctor said, what number is it? And it was only 92, 93 when she was on the phone, but he explained what it had been overnight and different things. And, and she said, well, you need to go to the hospital. I hate to tell you, but... And I said, I don't want him to go to, go to the hospital. Can we get oxygen at the house? No, you have to go to the hospital for oxygen. You just need to go and get some oxygen, and that's really it. I took him to the hospital. I drove him. I consider it the death chamber, honestly. I drove him to the hospital. We didn't talk about which hospital to go to. I just drove to one. And, um... He couldn't even get out of the car on his own. He couldn't walk at that point. So they had to get a wheelchair and someone met me there. And we went in, you know, they check your stats right away and his stats were fine, 94, 95 oxygen. And he was surprised at that. So I want to paint the picture here that when we called the doctor, his oxygen was okay. And when we went in the ER, his oxygen was still okay. He didn't feel okay, but his numbers were okay. So he, they took him to the ER, you know, to the room. They wouldn't let me back. So I went in the car and I just sat in the car. And then he texts me, I don't know, an hour later saying, just go home because I don't know how long this is gonna be. So I went home and I really wasn't super worried. I mean, you don't want your husband going in the hospital. Um, I knew he looked scared, but I felt like with the numbers and stuff, he was okay. He might just need a little oxygen and that's it. She suffered from COPD for 15 years, so she had uh, what we would have considered like um, symptoms of a COPD flare-up, um, shortness of breath, um, dizziness when she stood. Um, so she she used a three liter oxygen machine at home um, at night only for uh, her flare-ups. She wasn't like completely oxygen dependent, you know. She would you know check her um, saturation, and it was getting into the low 90s. Um, high 80s and uh she would get extremely dizzy so um we knew she had to go so um so that's kind of what led up to us you know being concerned enough to bring her to the er yeah. so on september 27th 2021 um when i brought her in you know i dropped her off at the door they were you know not letting anybody in at that point um, they tested her, said it was, she was COVID positive, um, and right away asked about her vaccination status. And, um, and then also right away, um, I had known some of the, the COVID hospital protocols. Um, I have, a, a friend who's a respiratory therapist and they had warned me about remdesivir and that a lot of people are seeing, um, what is happening after patients are receiving the remdesivir. Um, and it's and then I researched it and um, even the um, WHO, you know, the World um, Health Organization was um, saying that it was, wasn't benefic beneficial. And I just did a lot of research about it and found out how toxic it was and it had no uh, value for hospitalized COVID patients at all. So I told her, um, to refuse it right away. Um, and, you know, I have all the text messages between her and I, and um, she sent me like a picture of the name and she's like, is this it? My pulmonologist ordered it for me, I'm scared. And I said, just refuse it. So the next text I get from him is, you know, I can't stay in this place. Why did we, why did you take me here? Never again. 
Um, I haven't gotten an IV. I haven't gotten oxygen. I haven't nothing. And then the next text I got from him was, uh, finally, I'm getting some oxygen and IV. This was like 5.30, 12, I brought him to the hospital. So we went for oxygen and five hours later, he's getting it. Um, but the doctor said through a text that he sent to me that his oxygen levels are fine. He's trying to figure out a way to keep me overnight for observation. And then one day turned into two days to three days to four days. Um, and then on the fifth day, he texted me. Now again, I'm not allowed in the hospital. I'm not allowed to see him. So I would bring him food at the counter and they would bring it to him, things like that. We would be texting and talking. Um, and then the fifth day, he said, they're bringing me to another room. I have to have more oxygen. And I said, what in the world? Why are you going worse, you know? He had told me on the next morning that he got also remdesivir the next morning at five in the morning, the first day he was there, or the next morning, I guess it would have been. I didn't know what that was, okay. I just went to the hospital. I said, I'm done with this. I, I've been calling doctors and nurses asking for reports. I had not gotten any report in five days. So on that day that she was admitted, the 27th, same day they said she was COVID positive, when we asked about the remdesivir, um, they lied to her and said they don't prescribe that. So from from the beginning, it was started with the mani manipulation and um, not being honest. And then it wasn't until they finally got her into a room um, where they, a lot of times when a patient is prescribed a medication, they give them a pamphlet on it with the name and all of that. And um, she sent me a picture and, and obviously, uh, her and every everybody else that has the same story, they don't give the informed consent. They don't tell you how dangerous it is, how toxic it is, um, that it causes a multi-organ failure, um, kidney failure. So, of course, there was no informed consent, but luckily I had done the research. And uh, so she, she kept refusing it. So because she refused their protocol especially the ventilator which kept coming up from the very beginning and with the um with the oxygen that they were giving her i mean her saturation was getting better um and they basically withheld all of her regular copd protocol hospital thing you know medications that they would usually give her, uh, they, they were not giving her breathing treatments. Um, they weren't giving her steroids. Um, she used a three liter oxygen machine at home. They had her at two liter and she was doing okay. I mean, she, she was uncomfortable, but it was the kind of the same thing every day as far as there was no doctor that would go into the room to assess her, to listen to her lungs. Um, they would be outside of the window, wave to her. Um, nurses would not come when she would press the, you know, the call light. Um, and then when they would come in, um, they would belittle her. Um, she complained that she couldn't breathe. There was one night, um, this evil nurse uh, ignored her for hours, and finally when she did come in, told her if she couldn't breathe, she wouldn't be speaking. So it was just the same attitude towards her and basically severe neglect. And uh, the only thing that they were giving her was uh, Robitussin. But he said they hardly would come in. He felt very alone. Uh, he missed me, you know. So when I went there at day five, I said, enough. I said, I need the head doctor, the head nurse. I, I need to figure out what is happening. So they gave me a head nurse and she explained a little bit. Um, uh, the nurse led me up to the room and, you know, Tony was so excited to see me. And then while I was in there, the head doctor person, I forgot the title of the person, but he walked in. Um, I asked for ivermectin and he said that that's not known to work and that's, he made fun of it. Um, and I said, well, we need the antibodies. 
and um, he said he's already making antibodies. He doesn't need that. Um, both of those statements are not true. Now, I didn't know that. I just, I'm taking his word for it like I used to. Uh, hugely respected um, the medical community and what they said. That's the gospel truth. Um, but I learned later that, that it wasn't. So he, he was uh, kind at the moment, but very dismissive of anything I asked for. I also asked for high dose IV vitamin C, D, and zinc. And he said, those are not known to work either. So pretty much the three things I asked for in that time, and this was in front of Tony. Um, and he kind of dismissed it and said, he's going to be fine. He just needs a little this, that, and the other. He's going to be fine. You know, I have all the medical records, uh, which took me months and months to go through um, after her death. But um, so she was <clears throat> admitted September 27th. In all the medical records, it says she refused the remdesivir five different times. They ordered it. She said no. They reordered it. She said no. This happened five times. On October 6th, in the morning, her saturation was 95, which is great. Um, they started her on the remdesivir. And then that same night um, <clears throat> is when she started having chest pain and she started um, having a lot of distress and um, it just went south from there. And then those are, that's when I started getting the panicked phone calls from her saying she couldn't breathe. Uh, that's when they continued to leave her at two liters of oxygen after her and I begged for at least three liters, um, but they kept telling her that home health care ordered the three liter. And this has been a big topic of conversation with different nurses that I've talked to. Apparently, I mean, the oxygen is on the wall. All they would have had to do is turn it. I had a meeting with the lead nurse, but all of them had the same kind of mentality and all of them almost had a, like I've, I've said before in other interviews, like it's almost like they normalize the cruelty and the, the neglect to where, and then they use the, how contagious COVID was, was like a, a guise to continue to do what they were doing. Um, I got, finally got a call from the pulmonologist and he was tell he brought up the ventilator again. Um, <clears throat> and of course I said no. And he said that they were gonna move her to ICU and basically was giving me kind of a, a grim, you know, uh, outlook for her. Um, and then, you know, that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was tell her she was moving to ICU and, and for her to tell me I'm not coming home, am I? But, you know, right when ICU was mentioned, the palliative care in the hospice, you know, that was relentlessly brought up. They started her on extremely strong sedatives, um, which I know now uh, really suppress the respiratory system more. And when you have a respiratory um, virus, it doesn't make much sense, but, I don't know if she wasn't really telling me how bad the abuse and neglect was those first 10 days because that's how she was. She didn't want me to worry. Um, so I didn't know what was going on. And then by the time I was actually able to get out of bed and go up there, you know, the quarantine was like, like over, they said. So once she was in ICU, I was up there every day. Um, I didn't want to leave her because I had known what was taking place. And, um, they threatened me with security a few times because um, I, did, I didn't want to leave. I didn't trust them. There's many stories that I you know, would like to share about how they talked with me. So multiple times being asked, are you in the medical field? Um, that's just to intimidate me. Well, it didn't work. It never worked. It just ticked me off, to be honest. I felt like the, the attitudes were very, um, they've already decided who's gonna live and who's gonna die. 
I there was a there was a nurse at one point that he had a, a shortness of breath episode, and he asked her, "Does that happen? You know, does that happen often? You know, kind of go backwards a little bit." But she said, "I had a 32-year-old fit guy come in here on two two liters of oxygen, and by the end of the night, he was in a body bag." Now again, I have all the garb on, and I, Tony and I did, what? And he's a funny guy, and he said, "Whoa, that was that was uh, positive, or you know, um, that was encouraging." I think is what he said. And she laughed and she just went out of the room. That's an example of the crazy that went on. You know, here's a guy struggling to breathe. They see all the numbers. He's saying, hey, am I going to be okay? And she says, no, nope, basically. Um, he saw body bag after body bag pass his room. He texted me over and over, please tell them to close the blinds. He was told by many doctors, he had infectious disease, lung specialist, uh, intensivist, all of them. We have done the protocol. Week one, five, five days in, that day that I went to see him, we've done the protocol. There's no more medicines we can give him. But most of the attitude was pompous, was rude. Even the people that uh, did x-rays on him, you know, they did a chest x-ray every single day. You put the board under your chest and imagine any little movement gives you a whole much more shortness of breath. So he would say to them, please, can you go slower? We don't have time, you know. And he would have to bump up his oxygen to 100% after those, you know, x-rays and stuff like that. Um, they stopped breathing treatments just randomly. Um, then I would call and say, why is the breathing treatment stopped? Well, I didn't really have an answer. We'll start it again. What? Uh, I am not in the medical field. Hashtag. <laughs> I am a wife that is trying to fight for her husband because I felt like they were like, and they said it, we've done the protocol. There's nothing more we can do. When I noticed her starting to get worse, um, her saturation dropping into the 60s and 70s, um, and they didn't know that I was FaceTiming her and I was watching all of this going on, a nurse arguing with her, you know, when my mother's saying she can't breathe. There was another situation where a respiratory therapist didn't know that I was on FaceTime because my mother had put her phone down and she needed a breathing treatment. And the guy comes in and they all know she's hard of hearing. She wore hearing aids. Um, she, this is one of the nights she was in complete panic and cause she couldn't breathe. And, uh, he comes in and I hear her say, did you put it in? And I feel like he purposely ignored her. And I, I could say that it could have been up to two minutes of him ignoring her and not even saying a word. So she started panicking and saying, Dana, he didn't put, he didn't put the breathing treatment in. And uh, she picked up the phone and he said, I did put it in. And uh, I said something to him and he stood up. I don't know if he was sitting down, but he stood up and walked out, leaving her with no breathing treatment. I don't think he put one in. Did they do the best that they could for my mom? And my answer is absolutely not. From the very beginning, because she refused their protocol, which I found out later on, you know, all of these protocols that they were using, they get a lot of incentive from the CARES Act, um, from CMS. She was also on um, Medicaid, and it seems like with Medicaid patients, they get the biggest, largest payout. But no, they withheld, they withheld treatment. And then if you didn't want their protocol, you were left to die. You were left with nothing. I do not feel they were doing the best they could. I feel like they were working within a box, uh, within what the hospital told them. And the doctor even told me that at the end, the ICU doctor said, we are doing what the CDC, the FDA, and this hospital has told me to do, was the exact quote. 
They told him he's not going to make it. They, he watched body bags pass by. I mean, I, I can't imagine what my husband was thinking and feeling during those days, you know? And they just didn't give him other hope. I mean, there was a time at the end where the ICU doctor was talking to me. He said, listen, he's not going to make it. I said, okay, even if he's not going to make it, let me show you this text. He's asking for ice and water for 45 minutes to an hour. Can you just get him ice and water then if you say he's not going to make it? And literally, this is this is how he looked. This is what he said. <sighs> we have a lot of emergencies. And I was like, I remember just, I don't know if my mouth dropped open, but I thought you can't, like, why do we go to the hospital, honestly? If we can't get water, ice, and food, because that's what happened at the end. He wasn't getting any of that. I mean, that's scary to me, you know, just foundational care. Um, you know, they build over $500,000 and they can't find a person just to give ice and water and food to people. I mean, it's crazy. So I didn't have any confidence at all. I asked the nurse, oh, I need the doctor to call me right away. It's very important. What do you need? And she did that. What do you need? And I said, well, it's fine. I just, just have her call me. Well, I need to tell her what it is. I said, well, I need ivermectin. And she sighed. She's like, she's not going to do it. It's not, you know, they told me they didn't have it in the pharmacy. That was a lie. Uh, they told me it's not approved by the FDA. That's a lie. It's not approved for COVID, but it is approved. Um, so she ended up calling me in like an hour or two and I was desperate. I was calling attorneys. I was calling everybody I could think of to help me get the ivermectin in there. Um, and she called me and she said, I said, I'll sign any paper you want me to sign. And she said, well, you know, there's these side effects. I said, that's fine, whatever. And she said, okay. Now I'm not used to okay. So when she said, okay, I kept saying something else like, but we need it. And she goes, no, no, Patty, I'm going to get it for him. And I said, what? And I mean, sobbing, like I've never sobbed before. So I told him, I texted him right away. Listen, they're giving you this new medicine. Make sure you get it, blah, blah, blah. So again, he was on hundred percent high flow, you know, and she goes, he's, he's on 80%. I said, what? So I got on that garb, that gowns and all that stuff as fast as I could. And I went in there, I walked in. First one, he was sitting up, he was bright. And I'll never forget that day, that visit. He just talked to me over and over how great I was and how I fought for him. and. This is helping him. So I remember that visit was really good day. That day and the next day were just some of the best days of the hospital, he and I. And um, he was down to six liters of oxygen, not even on the high flow anymore. I took a picture of the high flow off. I'll never forget it was off. So I went there. He was only on six liters of oxygen and the, they said, He's going home. This was Friday. He's going to go home Sunday. We want to get him down to three liters, make sure nothing, you know. The next call I get was a nurse at like 4.30 in the morning. She is saying that she's very, very sorry. She's so sorry. And I said, what are you sorry about? And she said, I'm so sorry. I was at lunch and he was pushing the button and we weren't there and he had to start screaming for people and we got him stabilized he almost was ventilated and he's now moved to another room he's in the icu now so i said what happened from death's door to you're going home and now we're back at death's door again or whatever we are i don't even know yet because i'm not there so i got there from that point on, his anxiety went to a heightened level. He was afraid that would happen again. They starved her of oxygen for 10 days or a week, a week to 10 days. 
and they they caused her to have pneumonia. So they caused her to have pneumonia and then put her in ICU and then left her with no other options. I mean, they, they bullied us into hospice. They pushed her into it. They wouldn't release her to me. I called, called the cops. Um, I talked to the sergeant and he said that he couldn't go against an ICU doctor. Um, even with me telling him, I think that she's in danger. They, they wouldn't do anything. So by then, you know, a 59 year old woman with 15 years of, um, of COPD and going from being starved of oxygen to heated high flow oxygen. It's such a high percentage. Um, it's known to blow holes in the lungs and to collapse your lungs. And, um, they had her on so many sedatives and, uh, different things like that. So there was no way that I could have just picked her up and left with her. Um, so I almost feel like they purposely put these patients in these situations to where uh, they have no choice but to stay. The only ones allowed into the room were my sister and I. And I did talk the um, n lead nurse or nursing supervisor into letting the kids say goodbye through the window. So before we entered ICU with the kids, we put all the PPE on and there is at least six nurses just standing in the hallway. And this is supposed to be the thick of Delta, you know, and every room that I would pass by while my mom was in ICU, they were all empty. There were nurses standing around talking. There was no doctor there. There was no, nobody with hospice was there. It was just two RNs that, you know, were just working there for the day. Um, so they asked if we were ready and um, I was on one side of the bed holding my mother's hand, my sister was on the other side, and then the nurse comes in with two handfuls of vials. Um, and once I realized what she was about to do, I kind of squeezed my mom's hand, and I, I regret this to this day that I did that, because she woke up. She, she was on, on a lot of medication, and she looked like she was just sleeping. And when I squeezed her hand, she came to and saw what was happening, and she started shaking her head no. And the nurse just started putting the vials, and there was at least, I don't even know, 10 vials. And after looking at medical records and... Um, I now know what she was putting in. There was about 10 ml of Dilaudid. There was Halidol, um, morphine, Ativan, and I also looked up the dosing even for palliative or hospice care, and um, which is 0.5 to 1 ml of Dilaudid as needed. They gave her 10 ml within those few seconds. So after they did that, they took away her oxygen, and my sister and I had to watch her as she struggled to breathe. And then she took her last breath and it was 3.53. And that was it. So Dr. Bowden, thank you so much for coming on and, and, and sharing what you know about what's going on in the healthcare system right now. I'm outpatient. I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor, um, but I have sort of gradually become the next best thing in the hospital for a lot of people. So I've seen people come to my clinic with, I mean, I had a, my worst patient was somebody who came in with an oxygen saturation of 68% and he wouldn't go to the hospital. And I mean, <laughs> it's not something you would normally treat as an outpatient, but we, we managed to treat him as an outpatient. So, the, and he had a history of two heart attacks, throat cancer. He was not a healthy, um, a healthy man. Um, but the fact that he pulled through with outpatient treatment was very reaffirming about what I'm seeing um, and how horrible 
the patients in the hospital are being treated. And I, I've also reviewed some charts and just seen some just horrifying things. Um, I tried, you know, early on, I didn't know about ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. I just, I tried breathing treatments. So I was able to do those in people's cars because of where my clinic is located. There's no parking garage. Um, and then, you know, it's just gradually, it's a, it's a blur of, but I was using monoclonal antibodies and then started using hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin. And I got to a point where, you know, I, they rationed the monoclonal antibodies. The monoclonal antibodies worked great. I mean, it was just people turn around in a day. Um, but the government was rationing them. Early on, we could get unlimited supply. And then the government took over distrib distribution. And so I was really forced to use alternative means to help people. And that's where I really saw the power of, you know, initially all I did was ivermectin and vitamins. And I basically followed the FLCCC's protocol with the vitamin D, the zinc. You have, you're, you're standing up for what's right, number one. And, and maybe, maybe I should have you share your data real quick of maybe how many patients you felt like you have helped. I counted a couple weeks ago and it was 4,283 patients. And everybody that received early treatment is alive. I have lost a few people, but those are people that came in second or third week and were very sick. One thing I've started is I hired a woman who's, who went through the same thing with one of her loved ones to become an advocate so she can help patients, you know, navigate the system um, and sadly, that's where we are now is that you need to have a consultant <laughs> to yes. get your, you know, to get, make sure they don't kill you in the hospital. And I think a lot of people like yourself feel like, okay, what could we have done? What, you know, why, you know, but it's not your, I mean, you shouldn't have had to do anything. You should have just been able to trust your, your, the, your doctors. You know, don't put any of this blame on yourself or your husband or, you know, the blame should be to the doctors and, Never thought I would be um, wanting to sue a bunch of doctors, but that's where I am now. I wish, I mean, I hope, I hope they have to answer for all this because right. what they've done is just, just awful. And, you know, it's all very protocol driven. And that's something that has changed over the last 20 years of medicine. When I got out of residency, they just started putting these protocols in place for treatment plans so that you know, patient comes in with pneumonia. Well, this is these are steps you have to take. And if you don't take them, then Medicare is not going to reimburse you. So it's all driven by Medicare. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that when I opened my practice. I took time off for my kids and then I opened my practice three years ago. And I'm like, I'm not gonna be driven by Medicare. So I don't I don't I opted out of Medicare. But they everything now, your reimbursement you can get deemed financially if you don't follow these protocols. And I think that's part of the reason that the, the pandemic, the treatment and the handling of the pandemic has been such an epic disaster is because it's been such, it's so protocol driven. And when you're in something that you haven't encountered before, you've got to have flexibility, you've got to have some experimentation within reason. Um, and, but you can't have that with the government telling everybody how everybody's going to be treated. Thank you, Senator Johnson, for coming on and, and sharing what you have heard about what's going on in the healthcare field. Um, I appreciate your time today and uh, sharing what you know and how you can help other people. Well, Patty, I'm glad to contribute to this uh, uh, effort. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, it's tragic how much information has been censored and suppressed and how uh, little the American public really knows about uh, things like early treatment, uh, vaccine injuries. I mean, the, the whole the whole gamut of uh, information that has been censored and suppressed. How many hundreds of thousands of people would be alive today had we just allowed doctors to practice medicine to share their experience? I mean, that's what drove me nuts early in the pandemic. Uh, I was watching these doctors grappling with a whole new disease out of New York, working probably 18 hour shifts plus, mm -hmm. coming off of those shifts and then speaking in the camera like this and conveying to their colleagues, this, this isn't what we normally see here with, with this, something else is going on here.
and they were trying to communicate and they started censoring that. They're, you know, the doctors would get mad if I asked more than two questions because they had to do their rounds. They had to get, you know, going. There was no like looking at Tony, you know, like as a one time I said, I really need this lung medication. Could we try that please? And the, and the intens intensivist guys, he's like, I don't even know what he's on. <laughs> I was like, and you're doing the rounds? I mean. I was on a Zoom call last night with Emily Qualified, a cardiac surgeon. And he was describing the phenomenon of what's happened over the decades here where, you know, we used to have independent doctors mm -hmm. and then they would do rounds, they'd come into hospitals, but what's happened over time with the, you know, consolidation of the hospital industry and, and uh, you know, there's, there's very few independent doctors now. So they're all part mm -hmm. of the, the monopoly. They're all part of uh, you know, these associations and they're all uh, practicing protocols, which in many cases, probably most cases, that's totally appropriate. But in the midst of a pandemic, when we're losing so many people, mm -hmm. um, seems like you, you want to allow doctors to utilize their skill and practice medicine and try different things. Senator Hall, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about this important topic uh, about our healthcare system. Well, thank you, Patty, for having me uh, on. I'd be glad to do that. Uh, my name is uh, Bob Hall. I'm a Texas state senator, and uh, it's not a political office to me. It's a service office. We moved into an era where it has been very obvious that, uh, that people have died not because they had the COVID, uh, they died because of hospital policies, hospital policies that refused to treat patients until they got very ill. And then when they did treat them, they treated them with the wrong thing and much too late and then wondered why they died. And so I will tell you that most of the people out there that died over the last almost three years now, two and a half years, uh, did die unnecessarily. Uh, they died because of hospital policies, uh, policies that were set up to, uh, uh, with a huge financial incentive coming from the federal government to pay hospitals, to prolong the stay of a COVID patient in the hospital, offering them a huge bonus uh, for those COVID patients. And so that's when our medical, uh, uh, our hospital, went from being benevolent organizations unto a high profit center. Greta, thank you so much for joining us and uh, being able to share your personal story. So tell us a little bit about yourself and the story, um, how you were in the hospital, not feeling so great. Uh, my name is Greta Crawford. Um, I got sick along with the rest of my family and um, everybody else was able to get better. Um, I did not. Uh, I ended up having to go to the hospital because I was uh, coughing up some blood. I, I had gone into my regular physician and they gave me some really useless medications. And I ended up going home and I was still coughing up some blood, but when my oxygen got down to about 66%, I could not breathe. And I was struggling really, really bad. And I told my husband, I'm, I'm gonna die. And so he took me to the only place that we knew to get oxygen because that's really all I needed was oxygen. And I went to the hospital. And when I went to the hospital, they immediately gave me oxygen. After a few minutes, I felt better you know, already. Um, but the, the time that I was in there, uh, I, I wasn't sure what was going on because uh, I, my husband wasn't allowed in and I didn't have much oxygen to my brain. But once I got back into a holding room, they uh, told me that I was going to be staying there. And I said, well, why? Because I have oxygen. I feel better. Can I just go home? You know, just I thought I'd get oxygen, maybe some blood thinners for the, the coughing. And and they said, no, that had to stay for five days. And when uh, they were you know getting me, I guess, ready to get some medication, they said I needed I was going to have to take this remdesivir. And I'd never heard of it before. And I assumed it was a steroid. And I remember they had asked me several times, are you vaccinated? 
And he was getting ready to um, put a, an IV in and he said, have you been vaccinated? And I said, no, I have not been vaccinated. I am not a guinea pig, I'm not a lab rat. Uh, I don't believe in experimental drugs. I was very proud to say that I had you know, said it before. Uh, I did not know at the time that he was injecting two experimental drugs into me, not just the remdesivir, but another one that I didn't even learn about until after I read my medical records. Um, the one that actually is not supposed to be given when you have clotting problems. And of course I was coughing up blood clots. Um, so after that first dose, which was a double dose, um, which is something I, I, I still don't understand. How can you give a new, new drug to a new patient and give them double the, the, the normal dose on the first time? Um, but at, at the time I didn't know. I did uh, experience shortly after that uh, terrible side effects. Um, I finally, the last day, they'd given me the last dose. Uh, uh, so it was actually the following day. I had waited from 8 a.m. to about 7.30 p.m. And I had waited until I couldn't wait anymore. And I told him I was leaving and my husband was there. And I told them I was leaving. I said, I see a chair in the corner, it's on wheels. I'm going to get in that chair if you don't have my paperwork in five minutes and my husband's going to wheel me out of here. And they laughed at me and I told them, well, watch this. And I lifted up my shirt and I started ripping off everything and they ran and they came back within five minutes with, they were all gowned up, had all my paperwork, had a wheelchair, had oxygen, had everything in five minutes. And I had waited for 12 hours and I was like, it's amazing when you demand something um and and no and, and i i proved that i was serious because i was serious i was going to rip that thing out which i'm glad i didn't because it was like four inches long and my husband really passed out when they pulled it out but um yeah they they finally let me go and uh i got home i had i was in the most excruciating pain i'd ever been in my lungs were filled with fluid to where they were completely white um on the x-rays and it was so painful. It felt like a thousand knives stabbing me from within. There was no comfortable position. There was no reprieve from the pain. I had to sleep straight up for two months. I mean, straight up, it just pillows, you know, stacked on either side of me because it hurt so bad to move. Um, I went days without sleeping. Maybe uh, one out of 10 stories were survivors. And I realized how lucky I am, how blessed I am to be here. My family still gets to see me and these other families don't get that. Um, they, they were robbed and, and I don't let that, um, I don't let that, uh, lose my sight because I just don't want anybody to go through what I went through. And I don't want anybody to go what you went through, Patty. Mm -hmm. That's why we're standing up. They, they broke him down. You know, he was tired. He was like four to five weeks of literally struggling for breath, other than a little ivermectin freedom moment. Um, his fear was up because of how they talked to him. And he texted me saying, call, call hospital. It was like 5.30 in the morning or something. Somehow they called me on his cell and gave the cell to him. They said she, he's struggling for air. And, and I said, you're okay, you're fine, like I would tell him. And he said, I think I need to do it. We never used the word ventilator. We used like it, this, you know, I think I need to do it. And I remember saying, okay, okay, let's do it. I really regret that. He told me he loved me. He told me he's gonna take a break and he will see me again. He's gonna talk to me later. So I rushed over there right away. Uh, his oxygen was in like the 70s. You know, I heard people hold on for other people and all that kind of stuff. So I said what I need to say and then I I just said, it's okay to be with Jesus. And when I said the S, 
I saw the number 50, 40, 30, 10, 0. Like, as quick as that happened. And I said, I love you. And that was it. If I could describe that whole experience in one word or phrase, it would be life-sucking. It just took the life out of me, but definitely out of my husband. It wasn't a normal experience you would think when you go to a hospital. You go to a hospital, even if the outcome is death and they've tried their best, you know, you, you go there with someone's caring for you. Someone is positive, encouraging you. They have knowledge of medicines that will help you. They take care of you. And I did not feel that way for the majority of the time that Tony was there. So before Tony went in the hospital, I would say doctors and nurses, I, I fully trusted. Would I look up things and check it out? Um, I've had surgeries before where I've looked at, is this the best route for me? You know, I'm still gonna research and ask fellow doctors and, and nurses that I know what they think, their opinions. And when that didn't happen with Tony, that was an eye opener. That was the first inkling that I had that this whole healthcare has changed. I pray I never get so sick that I need to go to the hospital. That's where I'm at. I am petrified to go to the hospital. I had wanted to work in a hospital since I was a, a little girl. I mean, um, I've always been in the medical field. I, you know, was trying to finish my nursing degree. So before all of this, you know, I would have never in a million years thought that this was something that could happen in American hospitals. Um, but after this and me meeting so many other victims, um, I'm terrified of hospitals. Um, and it, it terrifies me, you know, uh, to know if something happens to one of my kids that I can, I, I mean, I can't go to the hospital. I would be very, I would be really afraid to. Um, but I mean, they failed my mother, um, without a blink of an eye. Like they, it didn't affect any of them. They were all completely desensitized from, from what they were doing to people. And, um, I think all the, all of the nurses and physicians that, that knew what were going on once the rollout with these protocols happened, I mean, they left and which is, is why they were so short staffed because there was too many that didn't want to be involved in criminal activity. I think that the government is obviously involved in healthcare at this point. And I think that stems from that. That's the bigger problem that all of this is stemming from. Um, and when you have um, government involved in healthcare, um, it's almost like you're on, you're, you're just a number at that point. And, uh, and then I think it just changes the dynamic of uh, patient care. There's so much we don't know, so much. Mm -hmm. Now, I would, I would say as human beings, there's way more that we don't know than what we do. But in our hubris, uh, when we start starting to understand some concepts, then all of a sudden we, we start getting pretty arrogant about the fact that uh, we apparently know everything. We don't. And I would just like the medical profession, I'd like society to have a far more open mind about a host of things, but nobody wants to ever admit they're wrong. They can't afford to be proven wrong. The body count is way too high and they have the power to make sure it's difficult to prove them wrong. Uh, I think the most surprising thing is uh, how many families found out and how many patients found out they lose all their freedom when they go in the hospital. They lost all their freedom. They couldn't leave. Uh, they, they couldn't be transferred. Their, their primary care, care doctor couldn't provide them the medications that the primary care doctor wanted. I mean, we're not talking about a third world country here. We're, we're talking about America that has, you know, that should have the freedom for, for patients to call the shots. The government had no business putting a financial incentive on health care. The hospitals are supposed to have as their number one goal is the 
treatment of the patients in the patient's best interest. Putting money in there as a financial incentive for whatever way it would be used takes away from that number one goal of, of in the patient's best interest. I think what the people can do is uh, be more careful about out uh, their doc their doctors that they pick be you know uh interrogate them talk to them ask them uh i would uh i would shy away from any doctor that give answers like those you've talked to i would scratch them off my list and would not even consider going to see them uh the the other thing is that <laughs> while you want to keep the politics out of it Unfortunately, the country we have grown into, politics is in everything. And what you see here in the hospitals is a result of the elected officials that that uh, you put into office. And so one of the things is you do to do a better job of vetting those people that you vote for. Don't just ask somebody before you head to the poll, who should I vote for? Find out for yourself, do the research. And when you find something good, let other people know about it. When you find something bad, let other people know about it. This story is really not about COVID. I mean, I have to share the story of the journey, but this, this story is really about how uh, governments and hospitals are making decisions and, and care for patients ahead of doctors. So they're making uh, money decisions. Um, what's best for them. There's uh, incentive if you're Medicare, Medicaid, there's 20% bonus that the hospitals get. If they come in with COVID, they get a bonus. If they die of COVID, they get a bonus. There's money for the ventilator, over $38,000. This is all on CDC you know, open for the public to read themselves. I'm not making this up. Um, so the incentive, if you think about it, is death. So all that they're scaring, their scared tactics and their bullying and their belittling, enough, enough. I'm standing up and other people are gonna stand up. I am not the only story. I really am hoping with sharing my story and other stories that we will be able to make a difference and a change. And because I think there's a lot of people that don't know about this stuff. I don't think they know what's really going on in the medical field right now. Um, and there are a lot of doctors that are coming out of it and that are standing up about it and nurses. Um, and sharing what's going on. And they are treating patients. They are talking with patients. They are letting them decide together what is best for them. They're giving them information. No medicine, no treatment should just be the one size fits all for anybody. We're not even talking about COVID when it comes to going in a hospital and getting treatment and, and having a say in what that treatment is. You know, so just like I did with Tony, so many things I asked for and the majority, were, everything was said no to. I would like for us to get back to what we used to be, is, is communicating with one another and letting doctors be doctors and patients talk with their doctors and figuring out what is the best. Pandemic or not pandemic, it doesn't matter. I don't care if we're, we all have colon cancer today. We all have the same cancer. Well, it should be treated differently based on your history that your doctor knows about you. But everybody stuck to the protocol. If I heard that word protocol one more time, even Tony texted me that, I'm so sick and tired of the protocol. The protocol sucks. It wasn't working and it actually killed Tony. The protocol went against what it was supposed to be doing. I think protocols are supposed to be helping people if you go in a hospital, but not anymore. The protocol is about money. It's about what's best for them. And it should never ever be about money, ever. 
if other people are, you know, they have a family member in the hospital for any reason, and they're not understanding or they don't know what's happening. I mean, sometimes we have to get an advocate or even just another lay person to help us uh, understand what's going on and to ask the questions that need to be asked. If you're not happy with the doctor being in a box, go find another person. There's plenty of other doctors standing up for patient rights. Um, and if you go in the hospital, you do have patient rights. You're supposed to have patient rights. So I think I would like to challenge all nurses, doctors, or anybody that's working in the healthcare field is just simple care, right? Don't check boxes. And I did the blood pressure and I did this, that, and the other, but look at the patient, listen to them. We need to put the care back in health care. We don't have that anymore. Uh, I don't even think it's health. And I want to challenge those nurses today, those doctors today, to stand up, to fight for your patients, to fight for their rights, and not allow what happened to Tony happen to another patient. For everyone watching this, I want them to know that there's resources out there to help them, especially in the early stages of any sickness. Um, there's things that we can do to help ourselves before even going to a hospital. If there's anyone feeling hopeless, I want them to know that they're not alone. There are people willing to come alongside them, help them, and fight for them. All right. Hey, this is Tony. Just wanted to let you know this is what it looks like to be in a hospital for 16 days with COVID. And I just wanted to say thank you for all your prayers, all your support that you've given me, that you've given Patty and the kids. And, uh, Hopefully I'll be out of this thing soon. But you guys continue praying. Continue uh, just uh, continue having us in your thoughts. And we love you. And uh, we'll see you out there real soon. Bye. Just to starve a mom. 